The Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast is brought to you by the following sponsors. EliteForm.com, IgnitionAPG.com, PlayUSA at PLAEUSA.com, and Soranex Exercise Equipment at Soranex.com. And now, the Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast. Welcome to Iron Game Chalk Talk with your host, Ron McKeever. Every time our athletes walk into this weight room, they're going to be pushed to the Let's max. Go. Let's go! Everything you got! On this podcast, hear Coach McKeefery straight talk about training, featuring the top strength and conditioning professionals from around the world. And now, here's your host, Ron McKeefery. Hey guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. I'm your host, Ron McKeefrey, and this is episode number 124. Iron Game Chalk Talk is a weekly podcast where I bring you experts in the field of talk shop. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to us on iTunes or YouTube or join the mailing list at ronmckeefrey.com to stay up to date with the latest guests and anything else that I have going on. I'm really excited to have Don Scott with us. Don is the strength and fitness coach for the U.S. women's national soccer team. Um, we all are very familiar with the success that they've had and, um, and just how they've inspired a country and inspired, um, you know, lots of young girls around the country, around the world, um, through sport. And, uh, you know, as coaches, as strength coaches, that's what we, we strive for. And so she gets to do it on a daily basis with the women's national team. And, uh, we bring her on, we talk a lot about just the different trends that she's seen in soccer, uh, working with a team that you know, um, you know, comes together for periods of time, but then goes to their different clubs and uh, different cities, and talking about the communication, talking about the relationship process with that, and then just talking about you know think, all the little trends, you know, uh, you know, technology trends and uh, programming trends and things along those lines. And so it's a really great episode. I know you're going to get a ton out of it. Before we get to Don, we want to make sure we recognize all of our sponsors. We have Sornex.com. Uh, ignitionapg.com, elite um, playusa.com, and of course, uh, elite form. And and can't tell you how excited elite forms coming back on as a sponsor in 2016. They've been with us uh, for several years now, and and uh, just some fantastic people and uh, fantastic product. And so, um, you know, they they've got some new features out. Uh, they have some competition leaderboards that are really cool in terms of just creating. Uh, competition within the weight room, you know they partnered up with um, Powerlift, and, and and they could power, they could partner up with any um, equipment manufacturer, but to be able to put the electric in the rack, and so they're just innovators at every level, and uh, doing it the, uh, the cool way, and um, it makes a huge impact. And we we like I told you, we put this in at Tennessee, um, and we're working to put in some here at. at uh, Eastern Michigan and uh, conduct some research with it. And so uh, really excited about the direction the elite forms going and, um, and just continuing to be an innovator in our field. And, and I can't think of enough for, for giving back in, in every, you know, in all the ways that they possibly can, but specifically with the podcast and coming on for another year. So if you're in the market, um, want to check out, you know, what, what they're doing, go to eliteform.com. And uh, talk to Skip and those guys, and, and I'm telling you, it's 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 pretty cool stuff. So, want to get to Don Scott. Know you're going to enjoy this episode. Sit back, and we'll see you on the other side. All right, guys, welcome back. Super excited to have Don Scott with us. Don is the strength and conditioning coach, or what, I, we'll get into your exact title because I know it's a great big long title. But uh, <laughs> but she's uh, with the women's national team soccer, and and if you have daughters like I do. Uh, you know the impact that the, the, the women's soccer national team has, has had on uh, young girls all over the, all over the country, and so Don, I, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you being on the show, and and uh, and, and what you know you and the, the coaches and the athletes are doing for motivating young women all over the country. So appreciate that. Thanks, Ron. Uh, thanks for that intro, and uh, thank you for having me on. You've uh, obviously got a very uh, yeah, talented group of uh, podcasts previously, so I'm honoured to, uh, to be asked to be on here. So thank you. Ah, uh, it's great. What well, you know, you got a great story. I mean, it, you know, tell us a little bit about how you got into strength and conditioning, and then kind of what's led you know to your current position. Sure. Um, obviously, 
I've got a weird accent, so I'm from uh, from the UK. So uh, I trained back in back in England, did a sports science degree uh, at Manchester Metropolitan University, and then uh, from there went and did a, a, a um, master's in sports nutrition in Aberdeen. Um, and then at the time, so I'm going to show my age here. So that was kind of the uh, the mid mid nineties, and at the time there wasn't. There wasn't really a lot of positions in sports science in sport, um, so I lectured for, for three years at Worcester University, um, and then around 2000, uh, the English Football Association, um, they basically expanded their sports science department, uh, so at the time I applied and uh, you know we then had a department where there was kind of four full-time sports scientists and four um, full-time physios or, or trainers as you guys call them here um, and basically our remit was to support all of the, the England national teams uh, so my focus then was to work with the, the England women's senior team um, but then obviously um, kind of support of the youth teams again at that time especially on the women's side there was absolutely no kind of sports science with the program so it was a case of developing sports science from scratch you know and again it was new to the coaches because you know this was 2001 and again it was you know new um and at that time the the England women's team were kind of amateur really um so again it was you know changing the training culture and introducing things which were feasible alongside the players working full-time as well um so I kind of worked there from 2001 uh we hosted European championships in 2005 as the is the host nation um, it did okay but didn't get out of the group but you know the build-up to the to the tournament was that the FA put a lot of support into the team and we were able to, to advance and develop the, the sports science program and um, and then after that we qualified for the for the World Cup in China in 2007 and um, at that time we got out of the group ironically in the quarterfinals uh, the US beat us uh, 4-0 uh, so that was kind of a, a bump back down to earth in terms of you know we obviously did well to qualify for the World Cup and to get out of the group but you know there was still that massive gap from US who were kind of rank one or two in the world at the time um, so again finished the tournament 2007 back to the drawing board what else can we introduce you know you're still trying to develop a full-time professional training culture with those you know restrictions of the girls being spread out all over the country and then also working pretty much part-time full-time as well uh 2009 european championships again we qualified for that that was in um, finland um, and in that tournament we actually reached the final of the tournament um, we at that time we had three players who um started playing in the u.s kelly smith being one who you know, it's, it's kind of uh, a big name out here. Yeah. Um, and so we had those three players with us and, you know, they'd come out to the US and suddenly their training culture was, you know, just because the kind of the American attitude culture anyway. So, you know, them coming back into our environment was just kind of bred out to the other players in terms of their, their application. Um, so we reached the final, but we were probably at the, at the maximum of our kind of resources and uh, we took a beat by Germany in that final um, but you know again no mean feat and we, and we reached there um, and then kind of towards the end of 2009-2010 uh, Pearson Hage who was the coach of the US women's team at the time kind of reached out and at that point they didn't have a full time strength and initial position with the women's national team they'd had somebody who tended to come in for six months maybe before a major tournament um, and she approached me and said that we're developing a role would I be interested and um, obviously you know the, the draw to work with, with the best um, nation in the world in, in women's so soccer was, was massive so 2010 I moved out to California didn't know anything what to expect or anything and uh, here I still am so uh yeah, that was kind of my process from education qualification through to kind of work experiences in England and then moving out here in 2010. Wow, that's fantastic. And it, I mean, it's similar to, to other people's story, but, you know, a couple of things I want to draw out of there is, you know, I think it's real impressive that, I mean, pretty much your entire career, you've had to kind of fight and scratch and, and create and, and be, you know, and, and have some ingenuity about the position 
and really kind of set a vision for what needs to happen without there really being the resources to support it yet or um, you know or having a culture in place that really or that, that really supports it as well what are some of the things that you would recommend to coaches because it's still I mean I mean we're talking it wasn't like it was 20 years ago we're talking 2009 the US national team one of the best teams in the in the world didn't have a full-time strength coach or full-time you know full you know somebody that's coordinating everything anyways and, and so you know, uh, and that's that's not uncommon. There's still universities across the country that don't have full-time strength coaches. What would, what advice do you give somebody to, as far as going in and, and 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 having to to set that vision and that culture and 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 recruit and, and uh, collect those resources? I mean, in terms of my role, so um, you know, we spoke about it a little bit. I'm not purely just the strength and conditioning coach, so you know, you could could look at that role and again how do you define it you know it's, I'm sure everybody could put their their role definition um, down there and it, all their job description is going to be very different from person A to person you know B and so on um, so I kind of do the oversee the strengthening initiative in terms of putting their programs together um, and then overseeing that in the gym when we're in camp but then it also encompasses the monitoring of training you know the when we're in camp the use of the technology the heart rate gps in, in training to, to kind of manage training loads and then also working with the medical side and then any kind of re injury rehab and injury prevention and then the whole recovery side so your nutrition your hydration um so it's kind of like a full you know a full full board of, of support with the team right um i mean one of my my things I sometimes get stuck with is am I being too basic because I look at some of the models whether it's a club or you know a national team and they seem very complex and telling players they should hit this amount of say high intensity running or this number of, of heart rate training minutes and you know you then strip it back and say okay well what are the basics do the players understand why you're asking them to to kind of hit those targets because for me unless the players understand you never fully get their buy-in um, and you know, even from the strength and conditioning perspective, kind of the last couple of years, we've really stripped that back and really looked at a movement screen, but not just kind of a generic movement screen. Refined it each year so that it's specific to soccer and then specific to females and then specific to our cohort of players. Right. Um, and you know that encompasses some of the players from college. Um, but you know, some players who you know, and having one back who's been involved. Um, for what 15 years at, at the national team level we got Christian Rampone who's 40 and right. you know was around in 99 um, to win the World Cup and it, you know it's involved here so I think not starting too complex too soon for me I would always put a blank piece of paper down on it sounds very simple and just look at okay in terms of my role my input what are the different areas where I can have an input or an impact with a player and then if you can even pick out two or three things that the player can do on their own without your input you've already started that process right um, you know we work with the national teams and right now we don't have the sports science or the the snc support there and um, can we have somebody in, he moved across to one of the other teams so again you know that's a whole new other area of of the youth players and you know a 12 13 year old player what should they be eating? What, right. How should they be training? Should you test them? You know, what strength and conditioning could they do? There's this adage that, sorry, I'm kind of going off a tangent here, but there's this no. the adage that, you know, strength can cause injuries or make players slow or you shouldn't be doing strength, you know, with a, with a youth player who's 10, 11, 12. Well, what is strength? Right. You know, is a body weight squat a strength exercise? Well, yes. Well, you look at kind of kids back in England in the playground and they're, jumping around and doing far more than a bodyweight squat so Absolutely. for me it's how do you define strength or you know movement and what can you do with an 11 12 year old that will be beneficial if they progress through your long-term model of 14 15 because they've got those both basic movement patterns in place um, so again I'm a firm believer of look at the big picture what are the areas where you can have an input and then are there you know some simple things you can make initially but, but then are there some areas you can then look at in depth and you know make big, bigger impacts and that then impact on other areas 
Absolutely. Well, you mentioned, you know, that, that, you know, you have many, you wear many hats, you know, and that, and, and obviously in a lot of the Olympic sport countries, you know, that's that high, you know, it's a high performance model where, you know, you're, you're coordinating all these different areas and they're all, you know, they're all talking. It sounds like with the national team, you're, you're, you're the one coordinating all those different areas. So you're almost talking to yourself sometimes, but, you know, but that's, but I think for the most part, you know, especially in the university system, I mean, as a strength coach, you, you wear that hat, you know, you wear all those hats. You're a sports psych, you're nutrition, you're, um, you know, strength, you're speed and agility, you know, the whole deal. Um, but I love that, I love that, that you know, you, you, you want to get it down to the basics, the core, you know, this is exactly what um, we need to focus on. This is where we're going to make the most, the most bang for our buck. When you're talking about the different trends that you're seeing um, in soccer right now, what what do you see that's positive and what do you see that's negative? Um, again, kind of what I touched on a little bit about, you know, kind of the advancement of technology. We're looking at heart rate, GPS, and you know, I know some clubs or or systems who will you know, set a threshold of high intensity running or play load, and you know, once a player achieves that, then you know, they're done for the train session for the day or for the week. And equally, you know, in a game, you know, I've had conversations with, with college s and coaches who say, you know, what, what amount of high intensity running should a player hit in a game? You know, what should the targets be? And I'm still of the mindset that we don't, I don't, we don't really know. You know, I've got, we got a GPS system in 2012. So I've kind of got game data from, from back then. So I've got over 200 files and, for me, I couldn't say to you, if a player hits this amount of high intensity running, it's a good performance because sometimes we've hit a lot of high intensity running and we've, and we've won. Sometimes we've hit a low amount and we've won. So how can you say to a player, when you, if you've hit 300 metres, let's just say, of high intensity running and we've won, okay, you must hit 500 metres every game. Well, she could come back to you and say, but but coach, if I hit 300 metres, we won and you right. know I got an assist and so on. So... I think we need to be careful and I know that some technical coaches have yelled at players who haven't done, you know, I know a case of a, an inside back who hadn't done much high intensity running a game, you know, partly positional and some of that is dictated by the opposition, right, because she's obviously fallen that forward and she's getting yelled at after the game because she hasn't done enough high intensity running. So again, I think it's, are we being too complex with some of those models? Um, can we accurately say that doing a certain amount of high intensity run or number of max sprints or whatever, for me, we still don't know the question, what is the key performance indicator in soccer because the game is so varied. So for me, it's, you know, sometimes you just need to collect data over a period of time until you have a good enough, you know, amount or, or number of games or so on to try and then streamline it and say, okay, can you then say, this amount of high intensity run or max sprints or player load or whatever correlates to a game winning performance but then even you could say the team have won but you know technically the right. player's stats might be low so again it's are we looking at the full picture or are we just trying to pick something that gives a player a target so I know that sounds a bit confusing but again I'm you know <laughs> I just think we need to be clear with what we're presenting to the players because you give players feedback or summary and they jump on whatever you say and if suddenly they're finding out that what you're saying is inaccurate like that that example about the high intensity run then suddenly they're questioning you and they're questioning your method so again you know I think that's that's one area um, especially in soccer in, in terms of sometimes being too complex um, and you know soccer's not a textbook model because you've got oh, 11 different positions on the field and you tend to have a squad of 20 to 25 players so again you know the college season here is is not your typical soccer season in Europe right and um, you know preparing for a tournament you're never kind of a textbook model so again I, I don't think there's always necessarily a right or wrong answer of how you do things you know even at times in the World Cup we had more rest days in between games than we've ever experienced before and sometimes you're you are you're gambling with what you do on those days because you want to make sure the players physically are prepared and for firing for the next game but you don't want to do too much that they're then fatigued or 
you know, not going to perform in those games. So, you know, sometimes I think you don't have to overthink things. You right. know, just sometimes go with instinct or know your players or your coach. And again, it's like the team support. It's, you know, and I'm very much about that, about it's not just about me, but, you know, what do the coaches think? What do the medical staff think? And, you know, trying to work together with players in terms of their development and then also kind of what we do in training and games. No, oh, that's great. Uh, you know, you touched on obviously the technology piece, and you, know, you said that you know you got your your system you know back in 2012, and so you've been collecting three years of data. And yep. you know, I, I we've talked about this on the show quite a bit. I mean, everybody would I'll get on my soapbox for a second. Then you know, if, you know, because it's great. I mean, technology is fantastic, and it, and it can help support arguments, and it can help educate, which I think is the, you know, the main way that I use technology, but. But if, if we use technology alone as as, as a standard, that's, that you're always going to run into those examples like you gave, you know. And um, you know, for example, you know, with HRV, if they, oh, oh if they, um, if they, uh, you know, if they have a poor HRV because they went out drinking the night before and they they didn't get good rest and and the whole deal, and then they show up and they don't want to train, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to reward them for their bad behavior for. You know, for coming in, you know, not taking care of themselves, and so using technology in a, in a is, is something that's been tricky. How I mean, so you've collected this data for three years, you know, and I'm, I'm assuming you have some other technology, maybe polar heart rates and, and things along those lines. How are you using that data and with your athletes and and because it is, you're right. I mean, these athletes are they're more informed consumer now. You know, and, and yeah. um, they have an idea of what you know what training should look like, and they have not, you know they're hearing. Uh, and they have access to a lot of different information as well, and so you don't want to provide them with too much information sometimes because yeah, yeah. you could be fighting a battle. Yeah, yeah, I think like you said, it's you know obviously technology is one thing, but for me, there's no replacement for verbal or feedback with the player. Um, so for me, that's that's the other important element of this, and you know some of the research that's coming out now is saying that subjective reporting is probably more beneficial and impactful in terms of the player and, and kind of their training. So, yeah, so we've used kind of heart rate GPS. Um, they used heart rate uh, from before when I came in, but 2012 we introduced a GPS. So we've got trends for games, um, you know, in terms of, you know, typically what a Rapino might do in a game, what uh, O'Reilly might do in a game and, you know, different positions um, kind of on the field as well. So we've kind of got ranges, if you like, of of some of the different parameters you can get out of the GPS. Um, we can then look at, you know, training sessions, drills. So I've kind of been through three national um, team coaches now. Um, so even within that, you know, with Pierre, somehow you like to do a lot of small sided games, um, and so you kind of you kind of got to the the point where you knew what the physical load of those small sided games and then the next coach liked to work a little bit different and now Gillelos works different again so it's some of it is then almost when you get a new coach you start from scratch again of, of the monitoring of the trainer because they have their own ideas thoughts philosophies and even you know the team play you know the switch during the World Cup of, of our formation and suddenly there's a different demand on Carly Lloyd, Lloyd going from almost a holder and kind of sitting deep central midfield player to that attacking midfield player so you know even that alone although it's still midfield it's two very different loads kind sure. of on that player so I think some of it is just is just having an appreciation of, of how that load might differ um, some of it is then trying to not calibrate train sessions but almost say okay Jill if we do this session this is going to be the typical load on the players but Again, it's can you really get an average? Because even within a drill, you're going to have an inside back and an outside back. You know, it's and sometimes I kind of just struggle to get my head around how can you just have one average when you've got all those positional demands in there. Right. Um, so we kind of use it, if you like, as a guideline of of the physical load on the players and more erring on the side of okay, let's not to and the and the other thing is you know especially with the GPS. Once you go into the higher speed thresholds, then it, it's known that the accuracy of those 
units are less accurate mm-hmm. and they depend on the satellite system. So again, if you're in a stadium, so it's say, for example, in the World Cup, a lot of the stadiums had a kind of a roof that closed some of the field and our semi-final was indoors. So again, you lose the GPS data, although you still have the acceleration data. But again, you know, as the speeds get faster, some of those parameters are less accurate. So again, wow. you know, you can, again give guidelines, but say, coach, just be aware that at those top speeds that it's not going to be as accurate. Or, you know, if you talk about max accelerations or number of high-intensity runs, there may be a 10% variability within a player and then between a player because they're obviously wearing different units. So again, I think it's a guideline to say, if we do too many max sprints, then obviously it's going to put an increased load on, you know, hamstrings, quads, and suddenly going into the next day could then cause muscle soreness. So I think it's more a guideline of let's not do too much of this drill the day before um, a game because we know it's going to be more fatiguing than, you know, if we do this session or if we do it for this number of minutes or reps or sets. So some of it is is a guideline. Some of it is then tying into so the players fill in an online uh, daily physical monitor. So they do it. It's literally five questions on a, on an app on their phone. So they fill it in, submit it, and then I can log in remotely, and our trainer can log in remotely. So if a player says they're injured or sick or whatever, it flags up. Um, we would get an email, but also we can just monitor them remotely. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, that depends on player compliance, and sure. you know that then comes from the coach buy-in. And um, so again, you know, Jill's been uh, super supportive with all of that, and you know, the players know they they have to be filling that in. Um, some of them just need a, a reminder now and again. No um, but then you know, you suddenly getting the player feedback, and sometimes it might be on a morning before we go to practice. Um, suddenly a lot of players are reporting muscle soreness or fatigue or tiredness so we might then adapt the training session we do or it might be that one player reports something so then it's you know you seek out that player and have that conversation to check they're okay right. um, but then again how you do that is important because suddenly you might reduce what a player does and they don't like that so suddenly next time they might not be as honest so right. again a lot of it depends on knowing your players, that relationship with the players, how that communication happens, you know, is it you to the player or is it the coach to the player to say, you know, we're going to reduce what you do today or whatever for this reason rather than them going, oh, I'm not going to fill in that that thing online again because it meant I missed practice or, you know, we did less or we did more. So again, I think it's how you use that information um, because, you know, players want to be out there competing and playing and, and so on. No, I agree 100%. You know, when, when you have, you know, you're, you're in a unique situation where you have players that come, you got them for a period of time, they go back to wherever they're from, to whatever yeah. professional teams that they're with. Talk a little bit about how you're able to maintain that relationship because so much of, you know, pushing somebody to where they're uncomfortable or, or really challenging them to, to better themselves uh, athletically is relationship based you know how are you able to maintain that relationship and then how do you communicate um expectations and program annual programs and things along those lines yeah i mean obviously the this this year is the third year that we've had the the women's professional league the nwsl so one of my big things each year is you know from the start in, in 2013 was I wanted to get into each team and meet the coach and meet kind of any strength and conditioning person um, that they had working with them. So I always try and aim every year to get to each team at least once and spend a few days there. Um, so for me, that's key in terms of that conversation, communication, and you know, just letting the clubs know that we feel that they're an important part of, of the players and you know their development and, and so on. And, you know, you then develop those relationships. So for me, that's kind of key and essential. Um, this year, leading into the World Cup, um, there was only really a three-week period where the, the players went back to their clubs. And, you know, a lot of that was to protect them from playing too much before we went to the World Cup. Um, so, again, a big part of, of the communication with the players in between our national team camps I would give the players a, a kind of a, a gap plan or a training program to, to follow in between our sessions, 
in between our camps. Um, some of the communication was from their online, you know, daily monitor. Because our part of that, they would put in, you know, heart rate training minutes, RP for the session. Um, so again, you know, we can track and monitor that and see how the players are feeling. Um, I would also have, you know, 20, 20 to 25 different schedules of where players might be in the days between camps. Um, so some of it, tracking it through there. Other than that, just, you know, your regular communication, emails, texts, phone calls. There was a group of players who would always come back to California. So I would have, you know, between four and six players training here. Mm-hmm. Most days we weren't in camp. Um, so just really a combination. And, you know, again, just knowing your players because some of the players might have been travelling a little bit on the, those days in between camps so they couldn't necessarily get to a soccer field. So some of it might be, you know, you're giving them a treadmill session or, you know, a running session outdoors and, you know, how a player likes to train and, and so on. So again, I think that piece of really knowing your players and kind of knowing what they need in between and then just keeping that dialogue process going. And, you know, some players, as with any system, are, are better than others in terms of the communication piece. Um, but again, you get to know that from knowing your players. Right. Um, so yeah, so just kind of usual media. Um, sometimes having to, to catch them on Instagram to see where they are, <laughs> what they're doing, which you know is is kind of the involvement of, of the current day in social media. You got you got to meet them where they're at for sure. <laughs> no yeah. question. Well, when you do get them, um, you know what what's a typical training session look like. You know, I mean, are you starting with the warm up, or I mean, you know, when they walk in the gym, what are they doing first? So, so it, kind of when we're in camp, so we t- tend to try and have two new lifting sessions a week. So as they come into the to the gym, they would start with some, you know, movement preparation work, whether it was you know band work, core activation, maybe it's Turkish get up, something like that. So they'd start out with between two and four. Um, specific exercises again from some of the movement screens we did some of that was specific to you know what came out from the movement screen so Mm -hmm. we kind of have different areas different groups with that Uh, um, and then they would do kind of their big lifts Um, so I am a fan of power clean so I always like to have you know some kind of power clean in there whether it's a you know, just a regular clean or a split clean or, or whatever. Um, so they kind of do the bigger lifts, clean squats, um, maybe the press, and then shift into kind of more functional, if you like, so RDL, split squats, upper body core work. And then we went through a kind of a big phase where, again, they would split off into their different groups based off of the, the movement screens and would do some specific either stretching or strengthening work around some of the areas whether it was areas of tightness or imbalance left right that we found and um, so to really kind of focus on on those areas so that would kind of be a standard kind of lift and just to shift from either exercise selection type or sets reps weights whether we shifted from you know strength hypertrophy power and um, kind of leading into the world cup mm. So when you when you're you're dividing these teams up, I mean, right now you're I mean, you're, you're a one woman band. You know, you got several different groups going on in the weight room. Obviously, you're dealing with an elite level athlete, but you know they're still athletes, right? You know, yeah, so yeah. the accountability and the and the and the supervision of that, you know, how, you know, how would you go about that? Are you are you partnering them up? Or are you, you know, how you how you ma- how are you maintaining that that high level of discipline in their training? Um, yep. as if they would be on the field, you know? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so either kind of two or three groups, depending on the size of our squad at the time. So, you know, you're kind of aiming, I don't know, at times you might have eight or 12 players in the gym, and then within those groups, buddy them up. So again, they would get used to lifting with a certain player, and, you know, some of that you buddy them up because you know somebody's very diligent and spot on with their technique and you might have a younger player you pair them with mm-hmm. or some of your kind of more senior players you might pair those players up and, and so on or you know if a player's got a different need of they kind of can't do a certain lift so you try and pair them up so they're kind of doing equal in, in that way um, and then the other piece is you know I'll the kind of the physical the PT I work with the trainer you know he's very good and um, so he would be there as as a second person and you know we'd then either have a third or fourth person whether it's another trainer or 
or somebody else there just kind of observing as well. So kind of a combination of that and and then just making sure, especially, you know, the, the bigger lift, just making sure the technique is, is, is spot on. Um, so we're really just being available around those lifts and, you know, if there was any specific area you need to play, you need a specific rehab, then, you know, Rick the trainer might work specifically one-on-one -on -one with that player. Um, so, again, and not perfect in terms of, of numbers ratio, although I'm sure, you know, kind of college, college uh, s &C coaches have kind of similar demands, but, uh, yeah, you just kind of do, try and do the best with the kind of resources and, and challenges you have, really. No, nah, that's great. Well, we, this has been awesome. Uh, you know, we always end the show with some resources here. So give us uh, the best piece of coaching advice you've ever received. Um, I mean, there's probably a couple of things. I mean, for me, I'm, I'm kind of a firm believer of working as part of a team um, and also just appreciating that the player is central to everything you do. So that's, is it advice? It's more a philosophy um, in terms of my, my mindset. And for me, several minds are better than one mind. So that was kind of a, a big one. The other piece, which uh, kind of a coach I worked with back in England, was uh, she always had a phrase where she said, you're not there to be liked, which from the sports science piece of mind, um, you know, sometimes you're asking players to do things that they really don't like and you're not their favourite person. But, you know, at the end of the day, I'm here to do a job. And, you know, I think the players then do appreciate that. You know, okay, many times I have Abby Wombike tell me how much she hates me, but <laughs> loves me really. Because, you know, you're putting her through a tough drill or a tough exercise or programme but she knows what the outcome is at the end of it. So, Absolutely. you know, I think sometimes you have to dig deep and and take some of those not so nice comments or feedback from players, but, you know, knowing that the outcome is going to be development of those players. No question. Well, they usually love you when they're winning, you know, when they win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> what about a, um, give us a book recommendation. You know, one may, one may be in strength and conditioning, one may be outside of strength and conditioning. Oh, man, that's a tough one. I mean, I'm not sure I'd say there's one book I've read, you know. I, I just kind of try and always keep out there. And uh, I, I would probably say I more have a network of people who I speak to and, sure. you know, regularly either keep in touch with them and exchange ideas or philosophies or training or um, kind of resources. So I'd more say for me would be a big fan of, of the communication people piece yeah. with either similar people in your field or you know like I said I'm going to see Lauren Lando in a, next month to you know just go and see some of his work I'm not afraid to say I don't know everything and you know I feel like the more I read the more I don't know um, right. so you know I like to get out there and see other people work and still try and tweak the support and you know advice I do with the players because like I said I don't claim to know everything so I'd more say you know, just get out there and do searches on the internet, the website, and, you know, just see some of the experts out there working in, in the different fields and either communicate with those people if, if that's possible or, you know, go and see some of those people work. And, you know, like I said, it, you're not going to pick up a hundred things to work within your environment, but if you pick up two or three things every time you go and see somebody, then, you know, it, it always makes your environment kind of better no question I, I couldn't agree more that's exactly why we started this podcast to be honest with you yeah 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 you know? for sure yeah yeah it, kind, you know kind of since you reached out of watched some of your episodes and you know um kind of others on the internet and you know just being able to sit here at my desk and i've got lauren lauren lando speaking to me you know, you know other other people from the podcast it's great because you know you, you're just kind of learning all the time no question um that's I, i'm i'm the biggest I steal the most from this, no question. What about, you mentioned an app that you use with your athletes earlier as far as player feedback. Is there any apps that you recommend uh, for interacting with your athletes or just your own personal productivity? Um, I mean, I'm not sure. Um, in terms of apps like that, um, I'm not sure. Again, I think there's kind of a, a whole range out there kind of available. Um, again, some of the... Um, I know Mike Young, who works at, at Athletic Lab, um, kind of on the East Coast, he's got his Fit for, fit for Football website, 
Um, so, you know, I kind of commonly check on there and he has up-to-date research in, in soccer. So if you're looking for more, you know, soccer-specific research work, that's a good website to go to. There's also a good one in the UK, sportsdiscovery.net, where, again, they regularly do kind of interviews um, with people working in soccer and um, high-performance sport. So, again, for me, they're good good sites for maybe it's not always scientific articles but you know perspective of people working in the field and practitioners so you know i think for me more and more reading experiences with other people and, and so on are just as beneficial as reading kind of the scientific articles no well, that's i couldn't agree with you more and uh you know it's it's refreshing because you know, it's exactly what you said. I mean, the more you learn about this business, the more you realize you don't know, you know, and, and we're all kind of having the same path and the same walking down the same, uh, you know, journey. And, um, you know, and that's where I think it's great. I think the show is great. I think the opportunity to talk to coaches like yourself is great because, you know, you're absolutely right. If you took one thing from this episode, you, you've got better and you made your athletes better. And that's, that's ultimately what we're all about. And, uh, I mean, you're a shining example of that. So I, I can't, I, I can't say thank you enough for coming on and sharing with everybody, and um, and just appreciate what you guys are doing, you know, there at the team and and uh, the work that you're putting out there. So thanks so much. No, thank you. No, it's been uh, it's been fun this morning. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. That's it for this episode of Iron Game Chop Talk. Thanks to this week's guest as well as our sponsors for bringing this episode to you for free. Make sure to check out ronmckeefree.com where you can join our mailing list, find the show notes, including all the links and resources mentioned, and information about Coach McKeefree's other products. While you are there, please join Coach McKeefree in the comments section thanking our guest for sharing. If you haven't subscribed to Iron Game Chalk Talk on YouTube or iTunes yet, make sure to do so. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome. Coach McKeefree can be found on Twitter at rmckeefree on Facebook and YouTube at forward slash Ron dot McKeefery. That's it for this week. Be sure to check back next week for another great episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk.